Some salty snaps. Well, good morning, fam. So good to see you all braving the rain and the harsh weather conditions. But it's a little bit cooler, right? For those of you with no air conditioning, I know you got to be loving the breeze. There we go. I, I knew somebody would appreciate that. Well, listen, as we get ready to worship, why don't we just pray and just uh, acknowledge God's presence, look to him and just ask him to uh, do whatever he wants to do this morning. Let's pray. Uh, Father God, we thank you. Uh, first, we want to acknowledge that you are God and you are good, even when we don't understand what the heck is going on. You are still good, and you're working things out for our good. We ask this morning that as we are present, that you would speak to our hearts. For those of us who are down, that you would encourage us. For those who are feeling heavy, that you would give us uh, joy in the midst of the tough times. And just pray that you would just really speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's stand and worship, fam. For you are for us, you are not. 
I invite you to read to hear David's word as found in Psalms 18. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord, who is worthy of praise, and I have been saved from my enemies. The cords of death entangled me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. The earth trembled and quaked, and the foundations of the mountains shook. They trembled because he was angry. Smoke rose from his nostrils, consuming fire came from his mouth, burning coals blazed out of it. He parted the heavens and came down. Dark clouds were under his feet. He mounted the cherubim and flew. He soared on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him. The dark rain, clouds of the sky. Out of the brightness of his presence, clouds advance with hailstones and bolts of lightning. The Lord thundered from heaven. The voice of the Most High resounded. He shot his arrows and scattered the enemy. With great bolts of lightning, he routed them. The valleys of the sea were exposed, and the fountains of the earth laid bare. At your rebuke, Lord, at the blast of breath from your nostrils. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. 
They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought, he brought me, me out, out into, into a spacious, spacious place. He, he rescued, rescued me because, because he delighted in me. me. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Would you affirm their reading and for the music team? I have to tell you that I was a bit of a geek growing up as a kid. <laughs> Easter morning, my sisters got rabbits, I got a duck. A bit of a geeky kid. And um, I want to tell you that part of my geekiness was a fascination with the space program. So when I was very young, Sputnik, the first satellite, went around the world October 1957, emitting this beep that anyone could pick up on a radio. And it launched the world into a space race, a space race that I became incredibly fascinated by. One of my prized possessions of childhood is a binder, I still have it, filled with newspaper clippings of each of the space flights. I would take the front page of the newspaper and carefully fold it and place it into my album, each Mercury, Gemini, Apollo flight. I was fascinated with the space program. I thought it was incredible. And when I was six years old, Alan Shepard went up in space for the first manned space flight. I was in first grade, and they wheeled a big color, color TV. Color TV was not in first grade. They wheeled a big black and white TV. And we watched Alan Shepard go up into space on that first Mercury. It was an only 15-minute trip, um, not very long at all, and I just couldn't get enough of it. I thought it was great, and I was a geek about space. And then I got glasses and became even geekier. <laughs> Please quiet down over there. <laughs> you all have photos like this one, don't you? <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Why do I tell you about my childhood obsession with space? I do it because I think it reflects something about the way God has created us. God has created us with a longing to be in open spaces. He has created us with a yearning for something big and expansive. This morning, you heard a psalm read, the 18th Psalm. And it begins in the second verse. It says, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. It's a song composed by David. He wrote it. And it's a celebration of deliverance from enemies. David was persecuted by Saul. If you know your Old Testament history, Saul was the king before David. It was kind of like a Game of Thrones episode. And David found his life threatened time after time after time, and he found that God was his deliverer. That was the one who brought him into safety. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. If I knew what that ancient tune to that psalm was, I would sing it for you. But I envisioned it in my mind something like Freddie Mercury's We Are the Champions. Can you hear that soundtrack playing? By the section of David's, but the section of David's ancient song that most strikes me is this. Saul was persecuting him. David finds deliverance and he says, God reached down from on high and took hold of me and drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy. He brought me out into a spacious place place. What is for you a spacious place? Uh, for me, I've always thought of space 
as this incredible, vast, open cosmos. I love to go out on a starlit night. We had one this past week. And just lean back and look up and drink in the spaciousness of God's great creation. It is freeing. It is calming. It is peaceful for me. For you, maybe open space is the great ocean, going to the shore and gazing out. Or maybe for you, it's something like the Grand Canyon where you just look at that majestic nature standing there before you, those rocks that seem to go on and on. Open space where you're not confined or squeezed in or hemmed in. So what's your open space? What, what do you find brings to you God's presence and peace when you are feeling trapped? What, what allows you to breathe? What allows you not to feel restricted? David, in one point in his psalm, sings about the cords of death that entangled him and of the torments of destruction, destruction that overwhelmed him as if he was caught in a tremendous undertow in the ocean and couldn't catch his breath and felt suffocated to the point of death. And then there's that marvelous statement in Psalm 18 that says, God reached down from on high, took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. I think that's a marvelous way of looking at the spiritual life. It is allowing God to draw us out of cramped spaces, suffocating places, and bringing us into the open expanse. When I think of chapel here at Roberts, I think that chapel, these weekly gatherings, these opportunities to remind ourselves about the God of David, the God who deliver us into spacious places. I want this hell auditorium for you to be a spacious place. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are thinking, oh, Pastor Wally, I don't think of chapel as, as freeing. I think of it as confining. After all, I have to attend at least some of these chapels each semester. And so you may be sitting there thinking that you feel forced to be here. You feel like cords are tangling around you, holding you to that chair. Maybe if you were to write a psalm today, you would write, the cords of chapel entangled me. The torrents of another chapel service overwhelmed me. But here's my hope. My hope is at some point some day, some chapel service, you'll open your mind, you'll open your heart, you'll open your hands to the Lord. And even while sitting in this auditorium, you will feel ushered into open spaces. Because that's what God does. When God touches down in our lives, He delivers us into open places. The openness of His love. The Apostle Paul, who knew an awful lot about cramped, places because he throughout his ministry found himself imprisoned for his faithfulness of the gospel he knew what it was like to be in a very small room with the door locked and yet even with all of those experiences as a part of his story paul found god brought him into spacious place even while imprisonment because of god's love at work at one point paul wrote how wide and long and high and deep is the love of God. God's love is spacious. And when his spacious love fills our lives, it brings us out of our cramped, narrow places. Do you remember the creature Gollum? I'm a bit fascinated by him, also known as Schmeagol from Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. His world is a subterranean one of mildew and suffocating humility and darkness. He's a pitiful creature. He's a tragic creature whose obsession with a ring has resulted in him being confined in dark places. When we live apart from God, that's what happens to us. We move in that direction. We become a little bit like Gollum. Rather than living spacious, open lives, we live in confinement. We become obsessed with things that shrink our world and too often bind us with chains. I've been on this campus 
teaching for more than 20 years now, and I have had hundreds of conversations, and so many conversations I can recall where I heard stories of confinement, stories of being in a very narrow, tight place. Sometimes it's been stories of addiction to pornography and and the obsession that that has created and how that has narrowed someone's world. Sometimes it's been about alcohol. Sometimes it's been about relationships that have gone wrong and have been done outside of God. Whatever it is, there's all kinds of things that can become confining to us, that draw us away from the openness of God and His love into cramped confines and we become like Gollum. So what do I want you to know this semester here? I want you to know how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. One of C.S. Lewis's chronicles, I hope you've read the Chronicles of Narnia. Would you stand and recite them, please? (laughs) One of his chronicles marvelously highlights the spaciousness of God. It's, It's the last in the Chronicles series, the last battle. Remember, it takes place in the land of Narnia where it's always winter and never, never Christmas. In the final book, The Last Battle, it's the last great battle for the freedom of Narnia, the restoration. And kings and queens and faithful servants of Aslan find themselves pressed to the wall against invaders and Narnian traitors. And the faithful ones who are serving Aslan are forced into a small stable at the top of a hill. And that small stable in it is the terrifying god Tash, the enemy of Aslan and the enemy of all that is good and true and beautiful. Uh, Tash is this horrible god figure, this satanic figure. And the good guys on the side of Aslan find themselves forced into that stable by the evil forces. And they expect when they walk into that stable to encounter this demonic presence, this satanic God. So they walk into the darkness of the cramped barn. But because of the power of Aslan, they discover walking into that little stable that they enter a world where there's a blue sky over a head and there's a grassy country spreading out as far as they can see from every direction. One of the Narnian kings, Lord Diggory, remarks, the stable inside is bigger than its outside. Yes, Queen Lucy responds, in our world too, a stable once had something inside of it that was bigger than the whole world. Jesus. Jesus takes us out of cramped places into grand open spaces. Now, Lewis is celebrating, isn't he, in that book, what Christ has accomplished. That child born in a cramped stable has brought us all who follow him into a land of blue skies and open grassy country. The God of David The God of Paul, the God of C.S. Lewis, is a God who ushers us into open spaces. And I have to ask you, is that what your experience is? Do you feel you are living a life that is in the open places? Uh, I want to suggest two things I think you can do if you're feeling cramped today. One way is to create space to allow God to work in your life. And You can do that numerous ways. Uh, One way is picking up the Bible. Uh, I marvel how the Bible continues to pull me out of my narrow world into God's great cosmos. I suggest chapel is part of letting God speak into your life. And part of that means when I come to chapel, I have to come with an openness to hear from him. And, and not allow myself to walk in and hibernate within myself and create a cramped space in this auditorium. And there are going to be all kinds of speakers this fall that you're going to hear. And some of them are going to resonate with you. Some of them are going to challenge you. But each of them has a love for Jesus and wants you to discover the open spaces 
when God's love enters your life. So how do you create space? Time to read his word, time to worship, time for prayer, time to reflect. One of the things you can do to usher yourselves into open space is to set a time, time aside, where you reflect on what God's doing. There's another thing I want you to do. I want you to have conversations with friends. Now, for me, that's always over coffee. For you, it may be over tea. I saw someone, what was it you were drinking today? A smoky? A Robert's Fog. I think that's where I live, in a Robert's Fog. (laughs) I've never had one. I'll have to try one. What I have found that most often what has helped me more than anything in my relationship with God, in getting out of cramped spaces into open places, is conversation with people who are further along the road than I am. Find mentors. Find people who just love Jesus in a way that is so visible. And spend time with them and say, tell me how you do it. How... How do you make God real in your life? How do you live with this? I I look at you and you seem to live with a a peace and a joy and a tranquility. How do you do that? Tell me your story. And it's amazing what you learn from other people when you sit over coffee and have conversation. So be careful. Choose wisely those you have those conversations with. Do it with people who you know are filled with the wide, deep love of God. The Old Testament informs us that on one occasion, David was being persecuted, threatened, his life in danger, and he flees to a cave outside of Jerusalem, and he's running away, and it says this in the book of 1 Samuel, David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam, and all those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him. Do you hear that? David is fleeing for his life. And who comes to join him? All who were in distress or debt or depressed. Well, thanks for coming and helping me out in my time of need. I tell you that because you want to choose wisely who you spend time with. They can be people that either pull you down into cramped places or they'll be people who usher you into the wide open spaces of God. Many years ago, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer, and she underwent treatment, pretty rough chemo, and for 20 years, she had a really good quality of life, and my family was incredibly grateful because her breast cancer had been quite advanced when it was discovered, 20 years, but then the inevitable happened. The cancer came roaring back, and it came roaring back with a vengeance, so I got a call my mom was at my sister's out in Tucson, Arizona, and I immediately flew out because they knew something was wrong with mom. And There was a battery of tests that were done to see what was going on. And While we were sitting in the hospital, my mom said, hey, this weekend, after all these tests are gone, let's go to the Grand Canyon. I've always wanted to go there since I was there at the age of 17. I haven't been back. Let's go there. So we said, my sister and I, sure, Mom. So after the tests were all done, we got in my sister's car and we began to make the four or five hour trek up to the Grand Canyon. On the way, my sister got a telephone call from the hospital with the results of the tests. And the results of the test were horrific. Cancer was everywhere. And the doctor said, uh, don't think a matter of months, think matter of weeks. So with that heaviness, we pull into the Grand Canyon. And we were so exhausted by the news, we all turned in for the day and got up early the next morning. And my mom and I walked out. We were staying right by the rim. And we walked out to the rim Well, it was still dark just before the sun rose and we sat down on the rim and as the sun rose over the Grand Canyon, marvelous array of colors, we sat and talked. It's one of those conversations you don't forget. And what I most remember about that conversation 
is my mother affirming that throughout her life, God had always been good to her. And she talked about how blessed she was and how much Jesus had touched her heart in her life. And she talked about her favorite child, me. <laughs> it's not true. So here we were. Now catch this. A woman facing um, eminent death, sitting in one of the most wide open spaces on the planet. But can I tell you, the biggest open space that morning was in her heart because it was filled with a love of God that cannot be contained. Um, I don't know when I'm going to die. But can I tell you, I want to live a life that is so spacious in the love of God that when it comes my time, all I can do is say, how marvelous the Lord is, how good life is, how precious this moment is. That's what I want you to do. I want you at some point this semester to create space for God to work. God, do your great work in our hearts this day. In the name of Jesus, amen. Go.